been a while since I did this. Right folks, first of all, do not watch this video if um, it's going to cause you any stress at all. Instead, relax, go study for your next exam, or if you have no more next exams, go and enjoy your summertime. It's all good. What you see here today is not accurate. These are just my guesses, and they cannot, I'm afraid, be used to um, represent your accurate grade. Wait and see what you get in August. It's just a quick run through, if anybody was wondering. Okay, question one is about rates. This is National 5 Chemistry by the year 2023, as you can see. Question one's about rates. Um, rate is change in volume over change in time. This time around, we're actually solving for the change in volume. So that's equal to the rate times the time period, which is D, according to me. Which line correctly represents a proton? These two are wrong because protons are inside the nucleus. This one is wrong because protons have a mass of one, so the answer is A. Which of the following compounds angular structure? That is your classic angular structure of water. Uh, let me get a pen so I can doodle on here. Probably a different colour for clarity. Uh, so we're looking for this sort of shape here. Now, you can only have an angular structure if you've got two things attached to a centre atom. So that's basically why all the rest are wrong. You, the, this is a little bit sneaky, because it might throw you off, but sulphur and two chlorines is going to be the same structure, as, or the same overall shape as water. Dear me, it's been so long I've forgotten how to do this smoothly. Which of the following diagrams could be used to represent the structure of lithium fluoride? It's a metal and a non-metal. Traditionally, that's ionic, although interestingly, in the same in the written part of the paper, we'll come across a question where it's maybe not. But traditionally, it's ionic. So therefore, I think we'll go with structure B. Number five, down here on camera. Number five, which of the following... Oops, sorry. And which of the following compounds does the iron have a 3 plus charge? It's an unusual question, this. Because, well, it's not an unusual question. This is an unusual compound. Iron phosphide. So basically what we had to do was run through um, working out that overall, all of these compounds have no charge. They're all neutral. So if you know the charge on the oxygen, you can then say it must be the same as the charge in the iron to cancel out. And oxygen is 2 minus, so therefore 2 plus. There are two nitrates here, and each one of these is 1 minus. So the iron must be 2 again here. The, this was a tricky one. We had to go and look up phosphate from the data book, and it's actually um, 3 minus. So there are two lots of 3 minus here, which gives you minus 6. And therefore, this must also be minus 6. There's three lots of them, so again, the iron is in fact plus 2. There's just three of them. Um, so the only one that's left, if you like, is this one here. And we can check phosphorus is in group 5. Group 5 is going to have a minus 3 charge. So therefore the iron has to be plus 3 to balance it out. That's not the best pen, hey? Number 6. Um, least moles of solute. Yeah, you've got to just work these out, I'm afraid. There's no shortcut that I could see. It was, it was just donkey work time. So um, I wonder if this was more of a maths question than a chemistry question. Um, you have to take the volume and divide it by 1,000, of course, and multiply the, by the concentration. If you do the sums on these, it comes out to be C. Number seven, which of the following substances shaken with water would cause the pH to uh, increase? That means the pH, uh, sorry, that means the substance is an alkali. Alkalis are metal oxides, so we can scrub out C instantly. That's a non-metal oxide. D is a sneaky one, I quite like it. Hydrogen oxide, of course, is water. Um, so shaking water with water is not going to change its pH. Barium oxide, on the other hand, is... So, uh, oh, sorry. Barium oxide and aluminium oxide are both metal oxides. So why is it barium and not aluminium? Because in the data book, as they suggest, this one here, A does not dissolve. The answer is B. Number eight, nickel carbonate, nickel hydroxide, nickel metal all react with dilute sulfuric acid, which the following statements is true for all three reactions. So that's like... The sulfuric plus that, the sulfuric plus that, and the sulfuric with this. So metal and acid makes salt and hydrogen. Metal hydroxide and acid makes salt and water. And metal carbonate and acid makes um, salt, water, and CO2. So not all of them make a gas. Not all of them make water. Uh, not all of them are neutralization. Metal is not neutralization. It's a redox reaction. So the answer is C. Nickel sulfate produced NO3. Can we take this up to there? There we go. Sodium carbonate can be used to neutralise hydrochloric acid. 
they've given you the equation here. You're looking for uh, the spectators and then take them out. Spectators don't change the charge or the physical state in any way. So according to my calculations, the answer is B there. Um, the name of the above compound, I had to draw it out here just for clarity. And the name of the above compound has got a one, two, three, four, five. So basically it's, and they're all single bonded. So the pentenes are out. So it's something, something pentane. Um, and you number them so the numbers are always the smallest. So this becomes one, two, not one, two. So we have two, two, four trimethylpentane, not two, four, four trimethylpentane. Number 11. The structure of 2 methyl but 2 -ene is this. Uh, which of the following, I'll try and get this on the camera at once if I can. Which of the following represents an isomer of this? So isomers are the same number of C's and H's, but a different structure. So my shortcut here was just to find five carbons in here. I wonder if there's any of these that don't have five carbons. Um, I threw out D for exactly that reason. If I can move my props, I threw D out because D has got six carbons. Um, I threw A out because A is exactly the same as this, just flipped over and then reversed. It's tricky to see without models and exam conditions, I'll be honest. So quite a sneaky one, that one, but it's wrong. B is wrong because the formula, the H's are wrong. This has got five carbons and uh, 10 hydrogens. Um, this has got five carbons and 12 hydrogens. It leaves you with this. You can do a quick double check. Or of course, you could just rely on your memory and remember that cycloalkanes are actually direct isomers of alkenes. For the equivalent number of carbons, of course. Number 12, which of the following would not be produced by an addition reaction of butetuene? So I drew it, butetuene here, and we're gonna break this double bond here. We're gonna stick things onto these two carbons. Um, this one could be produced if you just added hydrogen. This one could be produced if you added water. This one could be produced if you added uh, bromine, Br2, onto it. This one here is the correct answer. You cannot make that because if you look at where the OH is, the OH is on the end carbon and there is no double bond in the end carbon. Nothing's going to add to that one. Number 13. Ketones. Never heard of them. Must be a problem-solving question. Let's have a look and see what they've done. So they've taken this weird, that was carboxylic acids, two carboxylic acids back to back and turned it into this thing, which has got a little branch here, a little branch here and a sort of bridge of this C double bundle. But if you look, that there is obviously that. And this C2H5 is that. And these two are now bridged by the C double bundle thing, which is obviously a ketone. So all you need to do is apply the same logic to this these two molecules here joining together and forming our brand new uh, carbon oxygen bridge. And C2H5 on the left gives you that one, and C5H11 on the right gives you that one. Quite a lot of A's. I remember joking with Catherine, I don't know if Catherine's watching this or not in my class, but I remember joking with her that in recent years, the correct answer for SQA's chemistry seemed to be C's or D's. Maybe we should have started with C's or D's answers, but not this year. It's quite a lot of A's, which is nice. Which line of the table correctly describes methanol compared to octanonol? So the smallest alcohol you can get, quite a biggie, a big boy in the alcohol family here. They're comparing, this is tricky and only the linguistic interpretation of this. Depends how good your English is. You want to, the first one here has to be methanol and they're comparing it to octan tool. So methanol does not have a higher formula mass, obviously. So these two are out, which leaves you with these two is lower, but you have to remember that solubility decreases as you go up in molecular size. Oh, so in fact, <laughs> that's why I should double check my answers. And that's why you should double check your answers as well in exams. Um, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, that's the wording. The wordings confuse me. Methanol does indeed have a higher solubility in water compared to octanol. And methanol has a lower formula mass compared to octanol. Nearly tripped over my own questioning there. Number 15, which the following is correct for both of the molecules shown below. Data book time. They can be represented with the general formula CNH2N. I crossed that one out because that doesn't. That is CNH2N plus two, so that's wrong. Soluble in water, nope. None of these are soluble in water, that's wrong. Um, we had to go and check the, del and the data book for melting points, but of course, yeah, they're both saturated. S for saturated, S for single bonds between the carbons. Sodium methanoate is a salt. 
and it's produced by the reaction of a base containing sodium and methanoic acid. So that's very simple. That's C. I've said not great for that one. The reason I've said not great is sodium and methanol do actually react, but it's not covered at National 5. None of these other ones have sodium metal in it. And some people might be put off by that. It's, it's not a great distractor in my technical opinion. I might have come up with a different one. Something like um, sodium oxide and, I don't know, propanoic acid or something like that to keep it in the same way. But that's okay. I'm not writing the questions. I'm just answering them. Okay. Which shows the properties of a metal. Now, metals conduct all the time. Unlike covalents, which conduct none of the time. So B and D are both covalent. B is a covalent molecule because the melting points and boiling points are reasonably low. D is obviously a joint covalent network. Don't know why I'm saying this because that's not what the question's asking. The question's asking which one's a metal. It conducts all the time. Unusual melting point though. I've guessed that that metal is gallium. If you're talking elements, there's a few alloys of gallium that can melt uh, easily in your hand. They're used as liquid metal for building computers. Although if you're not as geeky as me, you probably wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Uh, number 18. Uh, this was a tricky one. I quite like this question. You had to think this one through to get the mark. Information about the reactions of three different metals, X, Y, and Z is given. They're looking for you to place the metals in order of increasing reactivity. So that means least reactive first, most reactive last. And if we take a quick look with water, we find Z reacts with water. That's bonkers then. In other words, so Z is going to be last, which narrows it down to A and B. Um, so we need to look at the difference between X and Y to figure out which one is... We want the least reactive first. And if you look at here, you find X does react with acid, whereas Y does not. So Y must be the first one. That's why it's the answer there. Number 19. Redox time. We've got... Um, the direction of flow is from A to B. So it's electrochemical series, guys. And the A must be higher up than B because electrons flow down like a waterfall. Go and watch my Redox video if you don't know what I'm talking about. Which one is correct? There's only what that one. It can only be that one. Um, D. Very simple. Number 20. There's a second Redox in the written one where it asks you to predict a value, a number of voltage. And that's a really unusual one. But we'll come back to that one in the second part. Number 20. Iron electron equations for the reduction of magnesium and silver are shown here. This is your classic one where you want the overall reaction that you have to join the... Uh, the oh, ooh, I just noticed that. That's unusual. They've written them both. Oh, I'll have to check that I've done the right answer here. Um, they've written them both as reductions. And that's not what happens, of course. Um, magnesium is higher up, so it will actually go the opposite way around. Excuse me, I'll just redraw these. Uh, so... Uh, did I get that one wrong? Let's have a quick look. Um, we need magnesium on the left, that's solid. We need silver on the left, silver ions actually. Get it right, hey? Silver ions on the left, um, which I've chosen, yep. And we need a magnesium 2 plus on the right, yep. And two silvers on the right, I have got it right. Don't show the electrons, guys. Um, that's the difference between the A and C. C is an identical one, except it's showing electrons. Um, that's wrong. Is that last done? No, not quite. There's 25, hey? Try and keep up, silly old fool. Which line in the table correctly identifies the reactants and products for the industrial process? Okay, so... I basically just pick the one that's right here. You have to know your stuff here. Haber, a reactant, that's something that goes in. So nitrogen gas goes into the Haber process and ammonia comes out. That's the product. It's basically just C. Uh, quite a mishmash of a question to read that one though, especially if you have any difficulty in terms of of reading. Um, tricky one to read actually. 22. An atom of thorium-227 decays by a series of alphas to form 211 lead. How many alpha particles? It's just donkey time. It's donkey work time that is. Guys, we start at 227 and for every decay you will kick off because an alpha particle is... Um, it's a helium nucleus effectively with a 4 and a 2. That means the top number here, the mass number, is going to drop by 4 for each decay. So I just dropped it continuously by 4 until I got to our target of 211. And the answer was 4 decays. 
Uh, my camera is still recording, isn't it? Because my phone's just told me to turn battery saver. Uh, I'll do this very quickly. Which salt cannot be made by precipitation? Soluble salt. It's C. It's the only soluble one there. Stay with me, phone. Stay with me. Number four. Uh, problem solving. This used to be in the course, they took it out, problem solving, and the answer basically is the mixture has got glucose, it's got no starch, and it's got sodium in it, so it's glucose and sodium chloride. The data booklet is for the flame colours. Uh, a weird titration, what a weird titration. They're actually asking you to figure out, I started off doing my normal titrations, and then I realised they're actually asking you to figure out the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. They tell you the number of moles of acid in the bottom of the beaker. So you need to use the fact that it's two to one ratio. If you know the moles of sulfuric acid, multiply it by two, and basically uh, that will tell you the moles of the sodium hydroxide. So this is all working out moles of acid. Um, oh, you don't even need to work out moles of acid. No, this is why it's doubly weird. Sorry, they tell you 0 0.002. So double that, you get 0 0.04. What an odd titration question. Thanks, folks. Let me take this phone out of this holder here. Hang on. Sorry about the noises. No, thank you for turning on battery saver. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye.